number five, hiding versus commissioner. Hiding is a really, really simple fact, Pat. You got husband and wife, they own a trust. It's a grantor trust. They're the beneficiaries. The trustee is a bank. Really simple fact pattern. The trust holds a bunch of different stock. The trustees are free to sell most of the stock any way, anytime they want. But there's these two particular um, companies of stock that it holds that the trust agreement says the trustee cannot sell it um, unless you know the, the, the beneficiaries approve of it, basically, right? So the beneficiaries can say, go ahead and sell it, we'll keep it, um, keep the proceeds, but the trustee otherwise, without beneficiary consent, is not supposed to sell these two shares of stock, okay? So what do you think happens? The end of 2015, trustees sell the shares of stock, right? And they generate a lot of gain, I think like almost $6 million of gain. Now, this is critical. The beneficiaries don't raise an issue. The beneficiaries don't say, you screwed up, right? You've got to make us whole. The trustees go, oh, crap. We didn't, you know, we just sold stock. We're not supposed to sell. Let's undo this whole thing by taking every penny of proceeds that we just got, and let's go back and buy those same companies of shares. But, you know, the market being what it is, Prices fluctuate. You wait a month, you're not going to get the exact same number of shares. So they spent the same amount of money, but they didn't necessarily get put back in the same position, right? Because you end up with a different amount of shares. Okay. So what does any of this have to do with anything? Well, let's step away from the case for a second and talk simple fact pattern, right? So you're, you know, you work for a company and they pay you a commission based on something you do every year. And they come to you at the end of 2021 and say, hey, good job. You did great this year. Your commission payment is $70,000. But then in 2022, before you file your tax return for 2021, they say, uh-oh, there was a math problem. We screwed something up. You shouldn't have gotten 70 grand. You should only gotten 50 grand. Pay us 20 grand back. Okay. All right. So what do we do about that? What we're going to want to do is say, on my 2021 return, I'm just gonna pick up the net amount. I'm gonna pick up 50 grand, what I ended up actually getting. Are we allowed to do that? And the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no goes all the way back to 1922, right? A case called North American Oil. And North American Oil established a critical principle for us in the tax law, right? The claim of right doctrine. And the claim of right doctrine, it's not complicated. It says, look, if you got cash in your hands that you uh, have an unrestricted claim to at the moment, right, you have to recognize that income, even if some situation could arise in the future that might cause you to have to give that amount back, right? The concept being obviously that every tax year stands on its own. But yeah, the idea is if you've got cash in hand that is not, you know, separated in some escrow account somewhere that you don't have access to. Like you got cash. Yeah, something could happen that you might have to pay some of it back. Your commission might have been miscalculated. You might have to pay it back. Doesn't matter. In the year you got that cash under the claim of right, you've got to pick up all that income. So what does that mean? It means the next year, when you repay the 20 grand, you'll have to deduct it the next year. Now, the thing about right? The tax law is, are you going to always end up in the same place, right? Of course not. Because what if in the year you got the big commission in 2021, you were in a high tax bracket. And then 2022, you decide, I had enough of this. I'm going to become part of the great resignation, right? You, you, you quit your job and you repay this money, but you've, you're in a very, very low tax bracket. So you picked up 70 grand of income against a high bracket and repaid 20 against a low bracket. You're not in the same place, right? So when that happens, we have a, another provision today we need to be aware of. Honestly, one of my favorite provisions uh, in the code, and I'm well aware of how that makes me sound. But with 1341, what they're trying to do is make people whole if possible. And what it does is it says, if you meet three requirements, we'll give you a choice. In my commission example, Go ahead if you want, deduct the commission in the year of repayment and see where that lands you. Or go back 
to the year of income. Don't actually amend the return. Just do a hypothetical calculation. Figure out what your tax was with the income in there, 70 grand. Then figure out what your tax would have been if you excluded the amount you eventually repaid, and that's 50 grand. If that reduction in tax is more valuable to you than a deduction in the current year, take that reduction and drop it onto your current year return as an estimated payment so that it's refunded to you, okay? So really cool provision. It's trying to make up for differences in tax rates and the like. The other thing that's cool about 1341 is it gives rise to awesome cases, right? Just because of the nature of 1341 and the the nature of situations where you're paying back a lot of money. Now, the three requirements to use 1341. Number one, you had to originally include an amount in income because you believed you had an unrestricted right to that income. And that, that's a seminal point in, in one of my favorite court cases ever, which we'll talk about just briefly. I think we might have even talked about Nacho a couple of years ago. I can't remember. We did, yeah. 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 Two, uh, in a later year, and this is what this case focuses on, it, it had to become apparent to you that, you know what? You didn't have an unrestricted claim to that income, right? So in a later year, a deduction has to be allowed to you because it turned out you didn't have a claim to that income and you have to repay it. And there's critical terminology in there. 1341 doesn't give you a deduction. There has to be a deduction available under some other provision, like a loss under 165. And as long as there's some provision that would give you a deduction for your repayment, 1341 will allow you to go ahead and uh, use it as long as something happened after the fact that requires you to repay that amount. And requires is a key term here. And then the third requirement is an easy one. The repayment's gotta be more than three grand, okay? So, but you could see where you could get really whipsawed now because let's say you pick up 50 grand of commission in 2021 and have to repay two grand in 2022. You can't use 1341 because it's only two grand. So you have to deduct it in the current year. But if you're an employee repaying a bonus, once again, that's an unreimbursed employee expense, non-deductible under 67G for the next few years. It's weird. We end up paying tax on phantom income. It's such a weird consequence, but it goes back to something you and I have said in the past. Nobody in Congress really thought about the consequences when they enacted 67G. Take that concept and let's just talk quickly about Nacho because it's just such a wonderful case. I don't care if we did it two years ago, it bears repeating. Hey, no, it um, definitely does. Let's, yeah, absolutely. It, and it addresses the first prong of 1341. And it's just, again, it's so awesome. Um, Nacho was a Denver guy and in, invested in Quest, big guy up at Quest and got pinched for insider trading, right? Sold stock uh, for $40 million of proceeds, uh, got uh, arrested on charges of insider trading, got tried, got convicted, went to prison, forced to repay the 40 million of proceeds. But he's not a dumb guy. So he's sitting in prison and he's like, wait a minute, I paid tax on that $40 million of proceeds when I sold the stock but then I had to repay it. And I'm sitting in a prison cell now and I repaid it. I'm not in a high tax bracket. I want to use 1341 to go back and you know exclude that income effectively from my uh, previous tax return, figure out what the savings would be and claim like basically it ended up amounting to like a $19 million um, refund. You know, it's just insane. And so he said, I want to use 1341 to do this. And I love this, but the court said, the IRS said, you can't use 1341 because rule number one says you have to have believed at the time you got the income that you had an unrestricted claim of right to that income. And you couldn't have believed you had a restricted, unrestricted claim of right to that income because you knew in your heart that it was ill gotten, that you had gotten it through insider trading and it wasn't truly yours. Now, Fascinating sidebar, we actually have another concept in the tax law called the claim of wrong doctrine uh, in a case called like James, basically, that tells us you embezzle income, even though it doesn't belong to you, uh, you have to pick it up in income under the claim of wrong doctrine. But that's neither here nor there. So they say you couldn't possibly, Nacho, have believed you had an unrestricted claim of right to this income because you knew what you did was wrong. And Nacho, to his credit, said, no, 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 right? You tried me, you convicted me, I'm in prison, but I never pled guilty. I still maintain to this day that 
I didn't do anything wrong. So you can't tell me I didn't believe I had an unrestricted claim of right to that income. And the court was kind of like, damn, you know, he's got us here. Um, now, he ended up losing in the end anyway, because they said to allow, you know, a 1341 for him would be uh, basically would frustrate public public policy. It would not be a good look to allow this guy to get a huge tax refund after he swindled a bunch of people. And so he ends up losing. But what's important there is it makes clear in that first point under 1341, you did have to truly believe you had an unrestricted right to the income. Now we come back to hiding after all of this. So they argued that in 2015, the trustees sold the stock they weren't allowed to. In 2016, they immediately repurchased the stock. And it's kind of funky because I don't know why they didn't address this in the courts, Damien, but we just said 1341 is not a um, deduction granting provision. Some other provision has to grant you deduction. They went out and purchased the stock back. I don't know where a deduction would arise there. You'd have basis in stock, but what they wanted to do was basically say, we want to pretend like nothing happened because we got whatever, six million in proceeds, and then we went back and bought the stock for six million. So we want to go back to 2015, remove the six million that we picked up in income, and then claim a refund on our 2016 return for that amount, right? Which you're allowed to do under 1341. But the IRS said you have a different problem than Nachio, your problem is you definitely had an unrestricted claim of right to the income in 2015 when they sold the stock, but you didn't find out in a later year that you were required to repay that uh, amount because you didn't have an unrestricted right. And the taxpayer said, no, of course we didn't. Like the, the you know, the, you're looking at us because the, the, the court said you as the individuals, you were free to keep that money. Right. You could approve the sale if you wanted to. So you could have kept the money. You didn't have to give it back. And they said, yeah, you're looking at us. You should be looking at the trust. The trust wasn't allowed to sell that stock. So they had to repay it. And that's where this critical distinction comes in, Damien. And they said, sorry, when we talk about 1341, we are not going to allow it for voluntary repayments. There has to be some type of compulsion, legal obligation to repay this amount. And the bottom line is the trustees sold stock they weren't supposed to sell, but you didn't object. You didn't pursue the trustees. You didn't, you know, initiate proceedings against them. You sat back and did nothing. And the trustees saw fit to repurchase the stock, but they weren't forced. And then the court, of course, added on, and not to mention, you're not back to square one. You own different amounts of shares that you did before. But what we really learned from this, and it, it, to me it is fascinating, is they're really going to draw a hard line between voluntary repayments. Hi, Macy. You got anything to say? Voluntary repayments and involuntary repayments. So... They said, again, and I think this case could have gone either way, but the point the court made was, look, you had the opportunity as the, the, uh, the beneficiaries and owners of the trust to immediately, when the trustees sold the stock, come after them. You didn't do it. And we almost view that as like implied consent for the sale. And so the fact that the trustees went ahead and, and repurchased the stock, that, that wasn't required. There was no legal obligo obligation to do so. Like Nacho... He didn't repay 40 million of proceeds out of the kindness of his heart, right? He was required to do it. Had to do it, so, yeah. Yeah, so really, really interesting case. Love 1341 whenever it pops up uh, in the, the tax law. Anytime we get to talk about Nacho, it's fascinating. And it fig finishes off our three kind of case ruling run of just – awareness, being aware of 1244, 1202, 1341. If we can accomplish that with people listening uh, today, then we've done our civic duty, Damien.